And across the country at this hour, we do have new reporting on this shooting at the end of the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl victory celebration this afternoon. A crowd of about one million people had turned out for the event. The shots were fired west of Union Station near the parking garage as the rally was ending. Initial reports had come in that multiple people had been shot. Multiple people had been shot. What? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever stopped and wondered what is it about sports that can move people to such high levels of passion and emotions? What is the power? What is the driving force? that can make someone so into a game that they can resort to anger, rage, and even violence. That they can even shed literal tears, whether it's tears of happiness of their favorite team winning or tears of sadness. What is it about sports that can captivate billions of people to have such a high level of passion, zeal, and emotions that they really do not express on that extreme of a level in any other area of their life? In fact, when you really examine the behavior of billions of people that are dedicated to sports. There's really only one other topic in the world that you can compare and explain the way they behave with such dedication. And that would be the topic of religion. But as the Almighty took me on this journey, what I have found out has changed my life forever. So will you take a walk with me as we dive into this very touchy topic that I call the occult roots of sports. I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics, and they were crazy. Well, you would think they were crazy if you didn't understand their culture and their religion. See, that's just the thing. See, they were worshippers of idols. And they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes, chanted, danced. They even made sacrifices to the idols. But they had built these enormous temples to worship the idols in. It seems like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. You don't really relate, do you? Let's try it again. I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics they were crazy. Well, you would think they were crazy if you didn't understand their culture and their religion. See, that's just the thing. See, they were worshippers of idols. And they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted. They danced. They even made sacrifices to the idols but they had built these enormous temples to worship their idols. It seems like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, 
what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Patterson back with the kick. In each quarter, preachers will be given a random phrase that they must effectively work into their message. And my understanding is these are completely random. They have never seen them before, seriously. You know what's well, hey folks, it's time to meet our players. Let's head down to the field for today's starting lineups. The myth, the legend, Brian Cole. the Bible. I will receive. Tom wins the toss, chooses to receive the Bible. Tom wins the toss, chooses to receive the Bible. Patterson back with the kick. Oh my goodness! Whoa. Is that a touchback? Can you yeah, even get a touchback? First time in 18 years there's a touchback for the kickoff. Super Bowl. For Super Bowl Sunday on February 5th at 4 p.m., the Super Bowl party will kick off right after our Super Sunday evening service. We will watch the Super Bowl on the big screens. Also, enter to win a flat screen TV. I'd like to invite everyone to Freedom Gate Church, 620 on February 1st for the Super Bowl party. And remember to wear your favorite team shirt. The NFL has loosened the requirements and they have a few things that they require if you're going to have a Super Bowl party at your church. Uh, I just want to tell you that Super Bowl is a big deal and it's a big sociological deal. And so we're not going to have Sunday night service at Orland or Lockport on Sunday night for Super Bowl. That's next weekend, February 2nd. No Sunday night. We also uh, at the, gave you some tools for at your party to invite your friends. And if you didn't see our video from the weekend, we'll give you some uh, hints of what to do, what not to do. The big game is almost here. Allow us to share some do's and don'ts for your big game party. Don't try to convert everyone at the party or teach a Bible study at halftime. Do be social and authentic. Don't advertise heaven and hell. Really, it's not about, you're not gonna share the gospel or anything there. You're just gonna connect with people. Um, this weekend's about football for people. So it's just a time to come out and have fun. We've got um, a lighthearted preaching competition between two of our pastors. And that's why I'm seeing a pastor right there. Yes, exactly. Find some of your non-Christian friends and go hang out with them. Don't spiritualize the game, you know, somebody holds up John 3.16, don't go, hey, do you guys know what that means? I, I, don't, don't do that. Just go be a friend, just go be a normal person and hang out. Remember that Hollywood is the magic wand of the dragon. And one of the most important movies to the Luciferians was The Devil's Advocate. But did you know that there is a scene within this movie where Satan takes his son to a sporting event. Now I want you to watch this scene and then you and I will have a conversation. What did you see in the spirit? Notice that Don King comes down to pay homage to the dragon bearing the cross on his neck. You see, brothers and sisters, the reason why this was one of the most important scenes 
for Hollywood to put within the movie was to demonstrate how important sports are to the dragon. This is one of, if not the most powerful way that he transfers from the masses what is meant to be given to the Most High God, which is worship, dedication, passion, and adoration. And it is transferred over, or better yet, mutated into fanatical worship, idolizing sports and athletes, which ultimately gives worship to the beast. Please remember that not only myself, but we all are commanded to expose the powers of darkness, no matter how many people love evil in the world. And before you and I continue down this road, I must remind you that we are commanded to do two major things when it comes to this ministry, revelations of Jesus Christ. Number one and most important is proclaim the glorious gospel of the Son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua the Almighty, who has come in the flesh. Do you understand? This is the almighty God who became flesh and dwelt among us, who died for you and I, shed his blood and rose from the dead to warn people to repent and give their lives to Christ before it is too late and preach everything to do with the kingdom of heaven. And the second thing is to expose the devil, to warn people of the many ways the dragon is deceiving the whole world. But we have to be fair. So I want to give a disclaimer, brothers and sisters, before we go any deeper, exposing the ancient occult roots of sports, we need to see what the Word of God has to say. Because this is not a documentary to discourage you as if you're not allowed to play sports, get exercise, and have a good time with the ones that you love within righteousness. I'll give you a good example. If I was going to do a documentary exposing the demons behind car accidents and drunk driving and speed racing, which is a documentary I would love to do in the future, Lord willing, do you think it would be unfair if I did a documentary exposing the demons that cause so many accidents by reckless drivers on the road and in that documentary condemn driving altogether, do you think that would be righteous? Of course not. You would say to me, servant of God, you have to be fair. 
just because others don't know how to drive and they want to drink and they want to race and they want to be reckless behind the wheel doesn't mean you should condemn driving altogether. If I'm going to be responsible on the road and obey the laws that are meant to keep us safe and give God the glory, why should driving be condemned and why should I be told to never drive again because of the foolishness of those who are blinded? Well, brothers and sisters, that same principle is what I'm bringing to you now. You see, I wanted to give you that analogy so you could have an understanding of how I am going to make this very balanced. Well, we're not here to condemn anyone that wants to play sports at the park. So I want you to be patient because I want to make sure that this documentary was balanced. That way, as we expose the forces of evil and principalities in high places, these ancient roots governing behind the scenes in sports, we also want to educate you on how you can use the gifts that the Most High God has given you to glorify Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua the Almighty. That whatever you do for activities of exercise, whether it's basketball at the park, joining a soccer team, playing tennis and football, and the list goes on, you will have the wisdom from the Lord and what you will learn in this documentary to know the do's and the don'ts, what to watch out for and what is acceptable to the Lord. You see, the problem with a lot of religious people is they don't understand that they have to have a righteous balance. The word of the Lord speaks of the abomination of an imbalance. So with that being said, before we expose the occult side of sports, let us go ahead and see what the word of God has to say about sports, competition, and trying your best to win the prize at the end of the race. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Did you hear that? You see, brothers and sisters, Paul was taking something literal as a race in the natural realm to compare it to what you and I have to do in the spiritual realm that we have to run this race we have to remain faithful to Christ and proclaim the gospel and make it to the finish line remember the word of God says he that endures to the end shall be saved but isn't it interesting that Paul uses something in the natural because one thing you have to know is wrestling and running in a race are very ancient forms of sport. And in the time that Paul the Apostle was writing this letter, Rome was the kingdom ruling in that time. And I'm sure you know that there was many sports that were performed during the times of Rome. But you see the wisdom that Paul had to compare running in a race, a sport very popular at that time, 
as an analogy, a parable, a parable you could say to show us the importance of not only running the race, but enduring to the end, not only enduring, but striving to get the prize. Of course, to lay it at the feet of Christ who deserves all the glory. But he then goes on to talk about how we strive for the masteries and have to be temperate in all things. And then he goes on to explain how those that are performing sports in the natural realm, they're looking to receive a crown that will only fade away in time. But we are seeking the crowns that are eternal. You see, brothers and sisters, even Paul the Apostle understood this mystery and was willing to utilize sports as an example on how we all should strive every day to run the race, to be faithful, to endure to the end, to strive to be the best we can at everything we do. So the question is, was he promoting a ungodly competition? Absolutely not. There's nothing wrong with godly competition to want to do the best you can. But the difference between those, the children of God, who are striving to be the best they can is because, number one, they want to give the glory to the Almighty, to God the Father. And they're also willing to help others in the process. That's the difference. Because you see, the sports of the world and the athletes in the kingdom of the dragon are prideful. They want glory. They're cutthroat. They don't care about helping others in the process. They want to receive that praise and that worship that, in essence, goes to the dragon. You see, there's a great war going on between good and evil. And even in the midst of sports, you have to make up your mind. Choose you this day who you will serve. No matter if it's preaching the gospel, at home with your family, or on a basketball court, who will you serve? What character will birth out of you? How will you behave in the midst of sports and competition? There's also a similar verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5, where Paul says, And if any man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. You see? So once again, you see the Apostle Paul encouraging us to do everything in godliness, not shady and crooked and unrighteous, but striving to truly be servants of God no matter what we do, to be willing to remain humble even when we do well and give the Most High God all the glory, encouraging others in the process, that is how you strive lawfully. But I was meditating on a father or mother that is so pleased with their son or daughter or children in the midst of some kind of sport where they can't help but to speak highly of their child and say, my son, my daughter is the fastest on their team. My son or my daughter is the best point guard on the team. My son or my daughter has scored the most goals in the season playing soccer. And as I was meditating on that, I couldn't help but to think about the character of God the Father. You see, in the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 8, it says, The Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, 
that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and hates evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house? And about all that he hath on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. But brothers and sisters, I want you to understand why the Lord revealed this verse to me when meditating on a parent admiring and thinking and speaking highly of his son or daughter when it comes to something. And in this case, a parent being pleased to speak highly about their child doing good in sports. You see, at this moment, God the Father was speaking highly about his son, Job. And of course, as you just heard, Satan made a challenge. That's really what it is. He said, look, if you take these things, things from Job, he's no longer going to be that faithful servant, that great athlete, you could say. Instead, he's going to curse you. But what does God the Father do? He actually takes on this challenge that Job will remain faithful to the very end, that he will run the race. He will endure to the end. It will be very hard for him, but he will make it. Yes or no, brothers and sisters, if you read that in the spirit, is that not a heavenly father? speaking highly about one of his children and how well they're doing in something and even accepting a challenge in the process. You see, brothers and sisters, wanting to do good in life, no matter what it is, in this case, we're talking about sports. That is not evil. Being competitive is not evil. And wanting to be victorious is not evil because if you are a child of God, we serve a creator that is victorious, that has conquered, that is perfect and excellent in all his ways. And we should want to be like our heavenly father. Where it becomes demonic is when pride tries to enter in, when it's no longer about a righteous race for a person to do the best they can to glorify the Most High God, it now becomes about them. They start to receive the praise and the worship and the glory. They become prideful. You see, that is the character of Satan, Lucifer. If you could see the two characters on a racetrack where you would have Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of God over to the right with his team and Lucifer, the dragon over to the left with his team. What would be the difference of characters? Lucifer would be telling his team, okay, get out there, do the best you can to get the glory for yourself. Be prideful. Receive worship and praise from others. Cutthroat and do evil to anyone who challenges you because it's all about you. That would be Lucifer's character in the midst of a sport. But you see, Christ, when encouraging his team, would say, get out there and do your best. Giving God the Father the glory that he deserves because he created you. You wouldn't be able to run as fast as you do if it wasn't for God the Father. You wouldn't be able to score the most points in this game if it wasn't for your heavenly creator giving you the ability to do so. So get out there and run the race. 
but do it for the glory of God the Father and be humble in the process and do your best to encourage others to be like me, saith the Lord. You see, brothers and sisters, I truly believe this is part of the mystery. And listen, I want to say thank you for your patience. Because I know there are a lot of you that only started watching this documentary because you wanted to find out what the occult roots behind sports is. But let me explain to you that none of these things matter if you haven't given your life to the Son of God. Think about what I am saying logically. You want me to expose the powers of darkness, but you're not even attracted to the light of Christ. Think about how stupid that is. And you were not created to be a fool. God the Father wants you to give your life to Jesus Christ. Adonai Yeshua the Messiah, the Almighty, he died for you. He shed his blood for you. So that way you can give your life to him in everything you do. You do it wholeheartedly and righteously, giving him the glory. Do you understand? So with that being said, I just want to let you know that we love you so much. And we really hope that these documentaries will truly draw you to the Son of God. Amen. Well, with that being said, I wanted to share something with you that is absolutely fascinating to me. So as I was meditating on the scriptures that talk about running the race, I couldn't help but to think, don't you find it interesting that when you watch these videos of men and women running a race on a track, what is the thing that most of them do just before the finish line? <laughs> I'm about to do the walk away. This is so amazing. Are you ready for this? They literally stretch out their neck and bow their head in hopes that it will help them win the race. But as I was watching these videos on the screen, the Lord spoke to me. Brothers and sisters, do you think it is a coincidence that these men and women instinctively, not only do they bow their heads at the end of the race, but they also form a bowing position in the beginning of the race. And you see, if you would do that in all that you do in life, because Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, so whatever race that you're running, bow in the beginning to give him the glory before you even start and bow to him at the end when you make it to the finish line. You see, brothers and sisters, this is, to me, this is a hidden revelation that the spirit man within them knows to give God the glory, but most of them don't. And God is saying that if you would just acknowledge me, if you would give me the glory and bow to me, you will win the race. You will make it to the very end. You will get to the finish line. But don't you forget to bow your head. <laughs> Look, I'm just asking you to take a walk with me. I found that to be completely amazing when I was meditating on that. So, look, I want to tell you one more, but I don't want to get too deep with it. And this is not a thus say of the Lord thing, but I was also meditating on the angels in heaven. And how they're all created different. There's different types of angels. You got angels, you got archangels ministering spirits, you have cherub angels, you have seraphims, and the list goes on, right? And if God created them all uniquely different, and they all have different powers and, and abilities, what if, wouldn't it be interesting that if in heaven, because remember, all the angels that chose to follow after Lucifer were casted out, Right? This included pride, self-exaltation, evil competition. I mean, you can see it because even the dragon and his angels are competing and fighting 
against Michael the Archangel and his angels. You see, that is evil competition. The dragon is fighting for his own glory and pride. Michael is fighting for the glory of Jesus Christ. You see the difference. So what if, as you know, these fallen angels and Lucifer were casted out of heaven because they were not Christ-like? What if, as heaven is holy and selfless and there's a oneness and angels are not trying to get glory, what if there is actually godly competition in heaven? What if there are times when God the Father is pleased to see his angels run a race to achieve a prize to give him glory and please him? You know what? Let me leave that alone. <laughs> Some people ain't ready for that. That ain't in the Bible, man of God. No, I didn't say it is. This is just me meditating because I'm excited to go home one day and look, I have a right to meditate on what if moments. That's just a what if. What if it is like that in heaven, right? Because if there's no evil involved, no pride involved, I don't know about you, but I would love to have competitions in heaven to win a race to give Christ glory. I mean, look, I'll leave that alone, whatever. But the point is, brothers and sisters, you got a race to run here on earth before you even think about a race in heaven to begin with. But never forget, as you're running this race, as you're on that track, bow your head. It might just help you win the prize. saved us and Jesus is the only answer. In his name that we go out there and perform and, and compete and, and use the, the gifts he's given us in the right way. Steph Curry fires away. Got it. Are you kidding me? There are priorities in life. You know, obviously your faith is, is, is first and foremost. I do a little sign on the court every time I make a shot or make a good pass and I pound my chest and point to the sky. And, that symbolizes that I have a heart for God, um, something that my mom and I came up with in, in college, and, and I do it every time I step on the floor as a reminder of, of who I'm playing for. And people should know who I represent and, and, and why I am who I am, and that's because of my Lord and Savior, so I can't say that enough. I went back to the dressing room, and as I was walking back and followed to cool off, started thinking, who cares about a stinking boxing match when I got money, I got cars. I said, I could, re I could retire now and die, die. Couldn't fight it. It just started dominating my conversation. I realized I was about to die in a dirty old dress room with all those homes I had. Right within my thoughts, I heard, the, I heard a voice say, you believe in God, why are you scared to die? And give money to charity and for cancer. And the voice answered me right back, I don't want your money, I want you. And I remember tears coming down because I knew that was it. My leg gave out of me. And I said, yeah. And I said, you just witnessed a miracle and you won't believe it. When well, they rushed me to intensive care, I lost a boxing match, but I was where I wanted to be in life. And I've been telling that story since. Hey, Coach Meyer, can I talk to you for a sec? He's like, yeah, how you feeling? Your arm good, leg good, you ready for the game? I was like, yeah, I'm good. Uh, you know the verse I'm wearing? He's like, yeah, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, strengthens me. I love it. I was like, well... I'm going to change that verse tomorrow night. What? What are you talking about? You can't change that verse. That verse got us here. <laughs> it didn't get us here. So after a couple minutes of explaining it to him, he totally was supportive and I understood. And honestly, after that, I didn't re even really think about it. I just went out there and tried to win the championship game. We were blessed to win. And two days later, I was at Ballyhoo Restaurant in Gainesville, Florida with me, my mom, my dad, my aunt, and um, Coach Meyer. And, Probably some of you have been to Valley Hoos, and I was just sitting there eating a grouper, and um, Coach Meyer gets a call, and he's like, uh-huh, 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 all right, bye. And I was like, who is that? He said, that was Steve McLean. Here's our PR guy at Florida. So what do you have to say? He said, did you know that during that game, 94 million people Googled John 3.16? 
And honestly, my first thought was, how the heck do 94 million people not know John 316? <laughs> <laughs> you can win and still be a Christian. I I'm sorry, what, what was that? In fact, you can win a lot and still be a Christian in a positive light. You can win all the time and still shine for Jesus. So I'd just like to thank the Lord Jesus because without him I wouldn't have this talent to play tennis. J'aimerais également remercier Luigi, me semble-t-il avoir compris, car sans lui je ne serais pas un joueur de tennis. Are you aware of the growing interest in your backpack? Can you give fans at all a hint as to what's inside of it? My iPad, I got my Bible, I got my headphones, and my phone charger. Whether he wants to promote me or humble me, uh, that, his, that is in his hands. You know, I don't think God cares about a certain game or race or performance, but he does care care about the condition of our heart. God has a purpose. He brings me back into his kingdom to, to use me to glorify his name, to let them, the people know that there is God who can raise the people from nothing into something. Care to take a guess as to what they will actually weigh when they get into the ring tomorrow night? I would guess that Mayweather will have a seven to eight pound uh, advantage over Pacquiao in terms of weight. Pacquiao was painfully honest about how his life changed four years ago. I want to, to have uh, um, friends around me and drinking and have girls are beside me and, of course, gambling. But then he says he heard the voice of God in a dream. I hate to do that anymore. And my heart is want to, to read the Bible, want to obey God. And that's, that's my heart. That's how God changed my life. The winner of the FIFA World Player 2007, Kaka. Tonight is really special night for me because when I was young, I dreamed, became just a professional player for São Paulo and play one game for the national team. Just it. But the Bible says God has got more than we can think or than we can want. And this is what happened. In my life. Thank you. Third and goal. Brady takes the snap. Here's the blitz. Rolls to the right. Fires to the right. It is intercepted in the end zone. Because God says He's placed eternity in our hearts. So all of us know whether we're professed to be atheists or whether we're Christian, all of us know inside that there is a God. There is something. We're, ha we're here for a reason. And the only way your vertical relationship can be made right is through the blood of His Son by turning and repenting of your sins, by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. All sin that's in us makes us do those things. And the only, the only salvation for this sin is the gospel. The only way to really cure that what's on the inside is understanding that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And so th to me, on a micro level, it's understanding. Yep, it, just like that. I saw my teammates putting different eye blacks under their eyes and uh, they're putting like their mom's name or their area code under their eyes and so I start to think, you know, I, I wonder if I could put something under my eyes that maybe could encourage someone or inspire someone. So I was like, well, God bless, I don't know. And then I was like, well, Philippians 4.13, I could do that. You know, I can do all things through Christ strengthens me. I was like, that would be, that'll be good for a football player. So I put it under my eyes and as probably a lot of you know, Gator fans are very passionate. So four or five, six weeks later, they're selling it at the Gator bookstore, at the Florida library. <laughs> you have thousands of fans showing up to games wearing Philippians 4.13 under their eyes. And I honestly believe half of them don't even know what it means. I had one guy, his name was Phil, come up to me and say, hey, did you wear that under your eyes for me? <laughs> I was like, no, it's a Bible verse. <laughs> Jesus is better than anything that we could ever hope. Even better than the Super Bowl, better than the NFL career. Is the any NFL coach supposed to say that? That anything is better than the Super Bowl? Don't Jesus, you. yeah. First Corinthians 10 31. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, so whether you eat or drink or play sports or watch sports, how do you do that to the glory of God? Particularly in a culture that idolizes sports in so many ways. You pray and you cover yourself. Yeah. So before the game, I pray at least four or five times before I step on the floor. That's awesome. And uh, just, yeah. just basically just keeping me strong, you know, because yeah. there's so many, so many things have been thrown at me sure. on the court, off the court. And there's sometimes where I do fall, uh, but I always have to remember, you know, what I stand for. I gave myself to the Lord, wanted to be a Christian. 
2004 when I got married, you know, I kind of went away from it when I went to the University of Georgia. Uh, 2004 when I got married, two months later, me and my wife, um, who grew up in the church, got baptized together, and then, um, and then I kind of went away from it again, but then it grew more into it when my, my caddy yelled at me a little bit, and um, so I've been stronger. I've been getting stronger in my faith and reading the Bible more and more. And, um, and then second, I got to thank uh, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> This day means so much more than, than putting on this green jacket in many ways. All right, so a uh, technical glitch there from Augusta National, but we will bring you much more. As I was getting ready to run out of the tunnel, I really felt like God was putting in my heart to change the verse. I was like, really, right now? And But I realized that if we won, we'd be playing a national championship on one of the biggest stages that I might ever get, and so that would be the right opportunity to change the verse. God kept bringing it to my heart and my head, John 3, 16, because it's the essence of our Christianity. It's the essence of our hope. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. It's what gives us hope as Christians. So I decided to go with that. And what goes into a streak to get you to the level you've been at over these last 12 games? What goes into that, Kevin? Thank God. That's all I can say. Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, thank you. You don't have nothing to do with it. No, uh, nothing. It's all him. Thank you. Mike. That's Jesus. Jesus has always been there. He'll never, never leave you, never forsake you. At the Patriot one yard line, Ben Watson shows the hustle, doesn't give up on the play, and he hit Tim. My Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in the power of Jesus, I won this in Germany tonight. You know, I came here to Germany in the lion's den to a great, great champion in Vladimir Klitschko. And my Lord, my Savior, my rock, my salvation, give me the glory tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. That comes to a stage in life where you've done, basically, if you've well, I've been a professional boxer since I've been 20, and I've been in the media since I've been 20. I've been a, a national star since I've been 20, really. All my fights have been live on TV. Mm -hmm. So I've had a lot of media coverage and attention over the past six years. So you can imagine the kind of stuff that I've got up to within them six years. Mm -hmm. So basically, been there, done everything there is to do, basically. And it's time for a change. You know, I've found God. Mm -hmm. I've asked God to come into my life and change the way I am, because I don't like the person I am. Mm -hmm. I like it when I'm doing it, but after it's done, I feel guilty and regretted. Right. So that old me is gone. Have you got anything you can tell us about? about yes, I have. I've got lots to tell you. Go on, just give us... Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Is that your reaction to what people who want you off the spotty shortlist? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And what about you being stripped of your belt? Yes, I mean, I that, that, that's, uh, you must be very unhappy with that. What's your reaction to that? Jesus loves me. And he loves you too, and he loves you too. He loves these people in here, and he loves everybody in the world. Any final message to those people who who have criticised you in recent? There's been a lot of criticism from people in signing petitions to the Scottish national people, to all sorts of yes, people. Yes, yes. Just give us just give us your take on it. Do you stand by your comments? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Okay, Tyson. The only way is through Jesus into heaven. That's all I can say. The A to Z, the Alpha, the Omega. Jesus is the way, the key, and the only way into heaven. Okay, Tyson, thank you. The evangelical is, is the most outspoken. It's the most, to, to quote Mike Silver, in, in his view, the most over the top, which is the very definition of being an evangelical Christian. Right. And I have absolutely, as a Christian myself, no problem with that. The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. A man's gift maketh room for him, and bringeth him before great men. A man's gift maketh room for him, and bringeth him before great men. I want to say something. Maybe I, I'm trying English. She, she, so sorry, I know the people don't understand me, but I'm trying. Hey! Hey, USC! Hey, Miami! Hey, Florida! Listen, people, listen, listen! Listen, what happened to you, USA? What happened to you? What's going on, you? Forget for the, the best of the best of the war. The name is Jesus Christ. What happened to you? Wake up, USA. Go, go back for you, go. Go for Jesus. No, forget Jesus, people.
Now, as we get ready to move on to the next level in this documentary, where we will microscopically examine the occult roots behind sports. I wanted to briefly just talk about the 10 minute compilation video that you just watched. First, let me give a disclaimer that number one, just because I showed you that compilation doesn't mean I agree with every sport that was shown. And neither was I saying that every single one of those athletes were sincere when they mentioned the name that is above every name. Because we know there are three main groups when it comes to those who become famous and mention the name of the Son of God. You have those who have an ulterior motive to win over a certain crowd that follows after Christ, but they are really agents, wolves in sheep's clothing that are being used on the chessboard of deception to deceive the masses by winning their trust, mentioning the name of Jesus Christ. The second group are those who mention the name of Jesus Christ but they are not truly following after Jesus Christ of Nazareth and living according to the commands of the gospel. And we know that if one is going to mention the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they have to follow him. They have to obey him. And the Bible says, what is it to gain the whole world but lose your soul at the end? So just because they mention the name of Jesus Christ does not mean they're born again. And this is why these people in high places of fame, these celebrities and athletes need your prayers for those that are savable, that you will pray that they would be willing to lay everything on the altar if that's what it takes to truly make it across the real finish line of their life. Now the third level, although it is the smallest of the three categories, these are the ones that declare the name of Jesus Christ and they truly mean it. They do love the Lord. They're not perfect, but they are striving to serve and follow the Son of God. And they need your prayers so much because they are surrounded in an industry of wolves. And as the world is working on them and they're fighting and they're standing at the fork in the road, being forced to make a decision. Do you want to truly serve Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Almighty? Or do you want to bow your knee? to the rules of the beast within the sports and entertainment industry. Because brothers and sisters, you can't serve two masters. So I wanted to make it clear that I know some of the people that were shown mentioning the name of Jesus Christ were not sincere and others are lukewarm at best but it would be unfair for you to just assume that anybody famous and, and anybody in sports mentioning the name of the Son of God has ulterior motives and truly doesn't believe. How would you like it if somebody falsely accused you? I know I've been accused many times by slanderers, but I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day, I will see him in one day as we stand before the Almighty Father on the throne. You will see who was truly following Christ and who wasn't. So my question to you is this. Do you think that it is impossible for God to save famous people? 
famous celebrities, famous athletes, that he can, just as Saul was a very popular Pharisee with much authority and much knowledge, but yet Christ stopped him on the road to Damascus, blinded him, and he dedicated his life to the Son of God. Do you not think that the Messiah cannot do the same in this last hour to some of these celebrities and athletes on their road to the Super Bowl, on their road to the playoffs, on their road to the World Cup? Do you not think that Christ can stop them and cause them to bow the knee, repent and turn and give their life to him? And is it wrong for them to declare his name after a sporting event? Even if we don't agree with that particular sporting event, you cannot tell me it doesn't have an effect on the millions of people watching. Tears were in my eyes when I heard that almost a hundred million people looked up John 3, 16. Now, let's make one thing clear. Sports can never be the vehicle that is needed to proclaim the gospel. No different than music. A music career cannot be the vehicle that is used to proclaim the gospel of Yeshua, the Almighty, because the gospel of Christ does not need sports to cut the hearts of people. The gospel of the Son of God does not need a music video to declare his name. If the entire world was to shut down and there was no more internet and there was no more electricity, make no mistake about it, the gospel would still be proclaimed by the manifested sons of God. So let's make that clear right now. But brothers and sisters, remember you have to have a righteous balance. You have to know how to abase and how to abound and do all things through Christ. You see with Paul, for the Greek, he became a Greek. And for the Jew, he became Jew. All things to all men. That doesn't mean he compromised. But he was a wise soul winner. So make no mistake about it. If God can use Nebuchadnezzar and call him his servant, that lets you know that the Most High can use anybody at any moment in time to do his will. And it doesn't mean that person he's using is going to make it in, but they can play an important role in the will of God the Father to serve a purpose in that moment of time to reach others. Think of Judas. Was he not sent out with the other disciples? Did he not go out and proclaim the word and do other things? But yet later on in life, he sold his own soul, you could say, and turned his back on eternal life. This is why I emphasize again on running the race because running the race means you have to endure. Even when you get tired and you're running out of breath and you're sweating and the sun is beating down on you, you're thirsty, you don't know if you're going to make it, the others around you are running faster and faster but you have to hold on you have to trust and put your faith in Christ to keep you from falling in this race and as I was meditating on this the Lord revealed to me Genesis chapter 18 when Abraham seen the most high God it says and he lifted up his eyes and looked and lo there three men stood by him and when he saw them he Abraham ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground 
can't you see that this is a revelation? Abraham, Abraham was considered a father of many nations, yet nothing compared to the Son of God, who is the greater Abraham. But did you see the revelation? But what the Most High revealed to me was this. Abraham represented the first race that Paul was telling us about in his letters. Remember, we must run the race. We must endure. We must strive for masteries. We must make it to the finish line. Remember that Abraham ran to meet Christ and he fell and bowed down toward the ground when he made it to the Lord. Can't you see this represents the race that Abraham ran towards Christ? Isn't it interesting that when he got to that finish line, see one thing you're going to realize is that Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah, is the finish line. That's the mystery. And when you get to the finish line, just like Abraham, bow. Just like those running track and field, instinctively don't even realize that by stretching and bowing their heads to try to win the prize, they're bowing. Bow to Jesus Christ. But you gotta run the race, brothers and sisters. And I know at times it's hard, but stay faithful no matter what. Continue to run the race because Christ is everything in this race for you. He's in you while you're running. He's next to you to encourage you. He's your strength when you are weak. He carries you when you are ready to fall. And he's the finish line when you get to the end of the road. So yes, although I know there are slanderers and Pharisees that always have evil to say, and just as the Pharisees followed the Son of God around and they didn't care about all the good he did, they didn't care about the miracles, they didn't care, the envy in them caused them to hate Christ, slander, and try to find fault on him because their minds were blinded by the hatred in their heart. I'm not promoting just any sport and I'm most certainly not signing off on famous athletes just because they mention the Son of God. But don't forget, brothers and sisters, one of the worst things you could do to discourage some of these athletes is accuse them and doubt them and put them down when they're actually trying to stand faithful for the Son of God. You don't think there is pressure on some of these athletes that truly love Jesus Christ? Some of these celebrities, you don't think they don't know the consequences of declaring the Son of God, knowing the size of the stage they've been given and how many they can influence? What about the persecution that goes on behind the scenes? What about when they're silenced and threatened but yet some of them still remain faithful. But most of them end up turning their back on Christ like Judas and bowing their knee to the dragon. So no matter what your gifts are, and of course, the real gifts that are mentioned in the gospel are not how fast you can literally run. It's not how good you can sing. True gifts are from the Holy Spirit that have to do with the gospel. And I'm putting them on the screen so you can read it on your own time. But that doesn't mean God did not gift you in other areas as well. And I don't know about you, but I not only want to glorify God the Father with the gifts of the gospel, but I also want to glorify him with the gifts that he put in me, that he put in me from my mother's womb. Whether that's to sing, I want to glorify him. Whether it's running in the park, playing basketball or soccer, tennis, football, 
ping pong, golf with my wife and children and our brothers and sisters in Christ. No matter what I do, I want to glorify God the Father with any gifts that He has given me. The question is, do you? Do you want to glorify Christ with all the gifts that He's given you? And if that's the case, blessed are you. But just remember, the dragon is also looking for gifted people that he can take for his kingdom. Those that were meant and ordained and even sometimes anointed to sing, athletic, a gift of speaking, whatever those gifts are, there are those that have been taken and they compromised and sold out for money and fame. It ain't worth it, brothers and sisters. What good is it to gain the whole world but lose your soul at the end? And no matter what gift you have, if it makes room for you, whether it's playing a sport, if it is God's will, may you make it as far as you can to gain a big platform to declare the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And if they threaten you and persecute you, find you and try to get you to stop proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, just like they did to the apostles. They commanded them not to mention the name of Jesus Christ publicly anymore. But you see, the apostles were not going to sell out. They didn't care about the threats of men. They let it be very clear. Ask yourselves, do you really think that we're going to obey men rather than the Most High God? So if you make it big in sports, or maybe you are already an athlete and you're watching this video, and you've been hearing the voice of Christ call you to give your life to him, and maybe you have a burden upon your heart that you don't want to give up the fame and the money, you don't want to get threatened and persecuted and hated, just remember something. You have to make your mind, you have to choose life or death. I don't know about you, but even a hundred years of wealth and fame can never, ever, ever be compared to an eternity with the Almighty God on the throne. So no matter how far you make it, and no matter how famous you got, no matter how much money you receive, if the agents of the dragon threaten you to choose and make a decision between fame and fortune and the almighty son of God, choose life. Do you understand? Choose life. All those riches will fade away. All that fame slowly changes. But the love of God will never change. So utilize whatever platforms you can without compromising. In the moment they try to make you compromise, that's where you lay that thing on the altar. I'm going to show you an example of what exactly I'm talking about. You see this man on the screen. Such an amazing football player. I mean, and when I say football, I'm talking about soccer which just so happens to be my favorite sport. I love playing it with my wife and children and our brothers and sisters. Just like many sports, I grew up playing sports. It's a beautiful thing when you can get together with the ones you love in Christ and go to a park and play a little basketball, a little tennis, whatever it is, but for the glory of Jesus Christ to have a good time and exercise the body because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And we know that exercise profits little according to Paul, but it doesn't mean we can't do it. We just can't let it become an idol in our life. That's all it is. We have to give Christ the glory in the midst of it and avoid evil while doing it. But with that being said, brothers and sisters, this man on the screen is one of the most talented soccer players I've ever seen in my life. 
And for a season, he was bold when it came to declaring the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But as persecution started to weigh down on him, and even FIFA Sports in the news was blurring out his headband that mentioned the name of Jesus Christ, he was threatened and offered a contract that if he signed it, making an agreement that he will not mention the name of Jesus Christ, he would be given so much money and not have to go through certain persecution. Sadly, from what I've heard, he signed on the dotted line, brothers and sisters. What a tragedy. But it just lets you know how much you need to pray for those who have gifts and talents and have the potential to make it big in any arena in this world. Because if they're not rooted in Christ, if they were not trained up the right way, there will be a price that they will choose to turn their back on the Son of God. But your prayers can be what gives them strength and covers them through Christ to be faithful to the Lord and even being willing to lay some of their greatest dreams on the altar and give up a sport and give up a record deal and give up acting or give up whatever it is that has gotten them famous. And you also need to pray for those that are now famous, that Christ can reach them where they are. Because if they're still savable, wouldn't you want them to be saved? Wouldn't you want to see that testimony of somebody so blinded and so lost in the darkness receive the light of Christ and even give up their passion for whatever it was in the world to serve the Son of God? Brothers and sisters, instead of judging unrighteously and looking for anything and everything negative why don't you pray for them? Pray for them. Because I know, more than likely, there's also somebody faithful enough and loving enough to pray for you. Last question. Um, of course, you weren't in Florida. Bit of a controversial moment, Yo Romero. And I know this is a very positive thing. I'm not trying to rain on that parade. Quite frankly, I don't feel like it was as controversial as some may, may think. But I just wanted to get your take on what happened. No, it wasn't controversial at all. But the reality is this, you just won the biggest fight of your career, you know? Um, America doesn't want to hear your thoughts on Jesus, and... America doesn't want to hear your thoughts on Jesus, and... You know, keep that stuff at home. Religion, politics, all that stuff. When you're out there fighting, and you're being interviewed, they want to hear about the fight. It's awesome that you love Jesus. Love Jesus all you want. I just don't have to do it publicly. I just don't have to do it publicly. You don't think he said what a lot of people thought he said, right? I know he didn't say that. Um, I know he didn't say it. Everybody knows he didn't say that. Um, yeah, I mean, pe people react to everything. But if you would just keep that stuff, you know, talk about your fight. You know, people don't want to be preached to. You know, talk about your fight. You know, people don't want to be preached to. Did you hear? What Dana White, the CEO of the UFC, had to say about one of his fighters mentioning the name of the Son of God. Brothers and sisters, this is not a game. There's a reason why we sacrifice so much time and I'm spending hundreds of hours doing these documentaries to proclaim the glorious light of the gospel and expose everything and anything about the kingdom of Satan because we are running out of time and we are outnumbered because the whole world lieth in the wicked one and now is not the time for you to be ashamed of the name that's above every name. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
Yeshua the Messiah. What happened to you, USA? What happened to you? What's going on, you? Forget for the, the best of the best of the world. The name is Jesus Christ. The name is Jesus Christ. But let me ask you a question. Why is it though, Dana White, who will bow his knee to Jesus Christ one day and all his money and power will not be able to get him out of the day of judgment? Why is it he forbids one of his fighters from mentioning the name of Jesus Christ, but yet Habib can talk about Allah all day long in the ring. Excuse me, guys. Alhamdulillah. First of all, I want to say thank you for God. God is number one. Other things is nothing. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. First of all, I want to say Alhamdulillah. Without God, we cannot do nothing. First of all, I want to say Alhamdulillah. God give me everything. Alhamdulillah. I know you got this. You don't like this. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. The man is Jesus Christ. But yet Dana is silent and has nothing to say about that. It's because the demonic realm is not terrified of religion. They're not terrified of false gods. The kingdom of Satan trembles at only one name. And it is the name above every name, brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua, the Almighty. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And the more they try to tell you to be quiet when mentioning the name above every names, it's the more you should be louder and louder and louder about that glorious name that can set the captives free, break the powers of darkness, and bring light to those that are blinded in the darkness. And speaking of darkness, I think it's about time that we move on to the next segment, to the next chapter in this documentary. Let us go ahead and expose the demonic occult roots governing the empire of the sports and entertainment industry. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. As you and I continue to walk on this journey together I'm hoping that by now most are intelligent enough to understand the strategy that has been used to put together this documentary layer upon layer in the proper order of things because only immature minded people 
want to hurry up and rush and learn the knowledge of exposing what the enemy is doing in the world. But those that are wise understand the principles of taking their time and doing things in the proper order. Because once you understand the power of the light of Christ and the importance of the real race that is far more important than anything else you could ever think of, the race to make it to the finish line of salvation, to endure through everything the enemy tries to throw your way. Then, as you grasp the revelation of the power of the light of God the Father, which is his son, Yeshua the Messiah, it is then you are able to handle the knowledge when we expose the darkness. So together, you and I will microscopically examine this commercial that was put together over 15 years ago by one of the most powerful Illuminati companies in the world called Nike. Before we get into this empire, I want you to see what the enemy is truly saying in this commercial using lesser magic and afterwards I will explain to you why this commercial had to be the one video to be exposed before we move on to the next level in this documentary I want you to pay attention to the Colosseum because that's going to be a word that you hear again later on in this documentary. But I want you to notice that this group of football players are outpowered and outnumbered by the enemy. Even the crowd is against them. Watch this in the spirit. And you can see that these demonic entities playing against these flesh and blood soccer players are not playing fair at all. They're violent, carnal, and unrighteous in their very nature. As Satan watches from his throne like a Caesar. And notice how when the enemy himself starts to see these flesh and blood soccer players who are a reflection of good versus evil within this commercial once he realizes that the demonic entities are losing notice that he comes off of his throne and enters the game himself now of course nike has to play this off and put a little comedy within it but make no mistake about it this commercial is very crucial for you to understand the information that is going to be revealed as we move forward down the road of exposing the occult roots behind the sports industry. Chapter 20. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and the people more than thou, be not afraid of them. Be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Hopefully, by now, many of you are starting to see the truth and your eyes are opening to what is really going on in this world. That the dragon is operating behind the scenes. And they know Jesus Christ truly exists and is coming back to the earth sooner than you think. And there is a great war between good and evil. But the reason why this Nike commercial was so imperative, so important for you to watch before we go deeper into this documentary is because there are two major points that you have to understand right now. And this was the hidden message that Nike was declaring to the blind masses. Number one, 
There really is a war going on between good and evil, between the dragon in his kingdom and Christ in his kingdom. And you have to make a decision and you have to choose what side you will be on. But just like that Nike commercial, the good is outnumbered greatly. No matter what part of the industry a person goes into, they are greatly outnumbered by the Luciferians, by the children of the dragon. And they are persecuted. They are threatened and even silenced because of their faith in the true and living God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua, the Messiah. Nope, it, just like that, we lost him. So you have to decide, will you bow your knee because of the pressure of being surrounded by the children of the devil that serve Satan in the world and in the industry? Or will you remain faithful to the very end? And the second point is no matter what sport that you play, you can only choose one of two sides on what type of character you will have while playing the sport. Just like the commercial, one team was demonic, carnal, violent, and unrighteous getting their powers from the dragon and giving him the worship and glory. And the other side will represent you and I. Will you decide to play sports in righteousness? That means if you're going to be competitive, it is not at the expense of pride and violence and ego and the list goes on. That you will encourage others in the process that you will seek Christ for an increase of skill, wisdom, strength, and the ability to do better in whatever it is you are doing. And you will give God the Father all the glory in the process. You see, that is really the hidden message within this Nike commercial. What side will you choose? Because you cannot serve two masters. I hope you choose life and not death, the light of Christ, and not darkness. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose wisely. Although we are greatly outnumbered and the giants are laughing, let us go ahead and throw a rock at the most powerful empire governing over the sports industry. And let us briefly investigate why this company was created in the first place. What is the significance of their name in the very logo that is on both sides of the shoes that they sell? And of course, the agenda that has mutated as the years have progressed towards the end of the days in this last hour. Nike, Greek goddess of victory and Zeus's charioteer of glory. Of all the Greek pantheon, none enjoys better brand recognition than Nike. Unless one is a true history buff, the word Nike is more likely to evoke mental images of sneakers than Greek mythology. It is, of course, no accident that the famous sports brand took its name from Nike, the Greek goddess of victory. Although Nike was not one of the most famous Greek goddesses, in her own right she played a very important role in the early days of mythology and was instrumental in helping Zeus acquire power. So, who was she and what was her role in Zeus's rise to power? 
The origin of the goddess Nike Nike has differing origin stories in two ancient texts. In the Theogony, she is the daughter of a Titan and an Oceanid. Her father was the second generation Titan, Pallas, the first Greek god of battle before Ares took the role. Her mother was an Oceanid, a sea nymph, named Styx. Nike had three siblings, Zelos, Zeal, Bia, Force, and Kratos, Strength. In the Homeric hymns, on the other hand, she is briefly described as the daughter of Ares, with no mother mentioned. Since this is just a passing reference to her parentage, she is still most commonly attributed as being the daughter of Pallas and Styx, and this fits her role in mythology best. Nike and the Titanomachy The Titanomachy revolved around the war between the Greek gods and their predecessors, the mighty Titans. During the war, it became clear to Zeus that if he was going to win, he would need all the help he could get. He called to all the gods, promising honor and power to all those who would side with him against his father, Cronus. He also promised the opposite to any who did not. The very first gods to declare their loyalty to Zeus were Styx and her four children. During the war, Nike acted as Zeus's charioteer, guiding his chariot through numerous battles. When the war ended, Nike and her children were richly rewarded by Zeus. Nike and her siblings became some of Zeus's most favored gods. They were allowed to dwell with him forever. Nike is often portrayed as standing by Zeus's side within Olympus. Nike is often described as either an attendant of Zeus, or as being so closely connected to him that she became a facet of his personality. So as you and I continue to go on this journey, putting all the pieces together, exposing what is done in the darkness, you will start to see more clear how the greatest empire that governs over the sports industry worth over a hundred and fifty billion dollars was able to achieve this level of power and authority by using the name of the goddess nike for their company and paying homage by creating a logo to represent her wings. This was an act of full submission, paying homage and giving glory, giving worship to the ancient principalities that govern over these so-called Greek and Roman gods and goddesses. Once you understand the mystery that is being revealed to you in real time, your eyes will open even wider and you will be able to see those things that are hidden in plain sight. It is very simple, brothers and sisters. You see, when these companies pay homage to the ancient gods of Rome, Greece, Egypt, and other places, it is really the fallen angels and the dragon that receives the worship. Understand that every Greek and Roman god and goddess is directly linked to a principality, power, ruler of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places, just as we were warned in the book of Ephesians. And these Luciferians understand this principle. And by making Nike such a powerful brand, causing billions of people to unknowingly participate in pagan occult worship by willfully paying for shoes and clothing that is directly linked to a literal, historical, pagan god, ultimately governed by a fallen angel, 
to receive the worship and deliver it into the hands of the dragon. And if you really think about the level of idolatry when it comes to buying sneakers, it is at a level that is absolutely staggering. People have become absolute fanatics over Nikes, Jordans, and the list goes on, paying thousands upon thousands of dollars, going to literal sneaker events to pay homage in the act of idolatry. So clearly, there is a reason why the empire called Nike has become so powerful. But we're going to get into that a little bit later. But what exactly is the goddess Nike known for? Remember in the video, she is called the goddess of victory. And you see, this is one of the mysteries they don't want you to know. Because at the same time, they try to persecute and silence the few that remain faithful to declare the name above every name. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua the Almighty. There is a secret pact and agreement with many athletes within the sports industry that they must pay homage to the goddess of victory. But we know this is a lie because the Son of God is the King of glory and victory is in His hands to the glory of God the Father. The video that you're watching on the screen is from the state of Tennessee where the pagan goddess Athena is holding Nike in the palm of her hand. This is how favored this occult goddess truly is to the demonic realm. I want you to watch this Nike ad and you tell me if this empire is just having fun and it's all just a play on words or does the Luciferians understand that if they invest and dedicate and pay homage to the fallen angels, the principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places that in return, they will receive wealth and power. Clearly, brothers and sisters, they know something most people don't. Every woman has a mountain in her life. Something that is holding her back. Something she's scared of. Something that would take great courage, strength, and resilience to overcome. So what are you waiting for? Your wings are pulsing under your skin. So what are you waiting for? Your wings are pulsing under your skin. So what are you waiting for? Your wings are pulsing under your skin. So what are you waiting for? Your wings are pulsing under your skin. Your wings are pulsing under your skin. Are you starting to see how the game is being played? You see thousands of years ago, the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans would worship these pagan gods and goddesses. And as they did it, it would feed 
and empower the demonic entities in the heavenly realm, ultimately strengthening the dragon. You see, until you truly understand the power of faith and belief, remember that we are all created in the image of the Most High God and made to worship Him by nature. And the dragon knows this mystery. So in the days of Egypt, Greece, and Rome, when the people would come together and worship these occult gods and goddesses, it was their faith and belief that would manifest power to feed the principalities and the rulers of the darkness. These fallen angels, these demonic entities would feed off of their faith and belief in these false gods that they would create and receive the worship as it was raised by the masses and in this last hour Satan needs all the power he can get in this end days great war between good and evil so one of the greatest ways he is receiving worship is through the sports and entertainment industry because all the ancient ways of mystery Babylon have flooded into society and the power of the occult has invaded the minds of billions upon billions of people. And so many so-called Christians foolishly think that worship can only be done when a person knows exactly what they're doing. But remember that the dragon deceives the whole world. How many times do you hear the word deception or deceived when it comes to the dragon? This means that somebody is tricked into doing something they don't realize they're doing. Over and over again, I have shown you in past documentaries that the greatest weapon the dragon uses is the power of deception. But what does that even mean? What does deceive mean? If it is his greatest weapon, shouldn't you want to know what it means and how it is operated. You see, to deceive means to trick. But that's a very interesting word, isn't it? That means that the enemy, the dragon, can cause millions of people to gather together and watch a sporting event while slipping in a halftime show of witchcraft and paganism misleading the masses and tricking them into unknowingly participate in high-ranking occult rituals. That word means to lead astray by underhanded tactics. To deceive implies imposing a false idea or belief that causes ignorance. Remember in the Garden of Eden, the dragon, that old serpent, did not tell Eve what his real intention was. Instead, he lied to her, causing her to turn her back on the Most High God's commands. In doing so, he became the God of this world. Adam and Eve were deceived into giving willful submission and worship to the dragon. This is how he became the god of this world. You see, for something to be a god, it has to receive 
worship, submission, and praise. So when you hear so-called Christians foolishly say that the devil has to tell them everything he plans to do, it is a lie. He uses deception to cause people to fall into the cesspool of mystery Babylon, committing idolatry, unknowingly participating in ancient occult rituals and pagan worship of demon gods, provoking the Most High to anger. One of the most powerful rituals performed every year is at the Super Bowl during the halftime show. The video playing on the screen was performed during the halftime of one of the past Super Bowls. Notice how they are dressed up in Greek and Roman attire. Madonna, who is one of the most highest ranking witches in the industry. Do you think this is all just a game, brothers and sisters? Or is this not deception to draw in millions upon millions of people under the guise of entertainment to unknowingly be led astray to participate in the occult practices of mystery Babylon? Because remember... Silence can also condemn you. Because if you see the occult practices of these wicked ceremonies and the worship of demon gods and you say nothing and do nothing about it, your silence affirms it. Never forget it. And remember the stumbling block of Balak, Balaam, that Jesus Christ was talking about in the book of Revelation. It is idolatry that provokes the Most High God to anger. So as we move deeper into this documentary, let us examine how many different ways how many different athletes in different types of sports are really involved in the occult of mystery Babylon. And we will also examine some of the many ways these occult rituals are propagated, are put upon the masses while they're being entertained or playing sports without even knowing it. So I hope your eyes are opened to the truth of what is really going on. And with that being said, let us begin. This is the sign of the horns. A curse sign. A curse sign. Touchdown. He 
It's Kevin King. If he holds on to this ball, then goes to replay in New York. I think that. Start this possession for Garoppolo in San Francisco. Well, the Rams are on a max zone when the guy comes into there. This is exactly why you need to be on point. It's not a game. And Satanism has soldiers in many places. And because I got so many other topics to go over with you, I'm not going to sit here and show you a hundred clips on athletes and celebrities throwing up the sign of the Baphomet. You get the point. But one thing that I do want to show you that was revealed to me as I was meditating in the spirit. I was meditating on bowling. This one is so crafty that I literally had to go to a bowling alley to show you on camera because it is very hard to find a good example online. So the footage you're about to watch is me witnessing to a group of young brothers and telling them about this very documentary that I've been working on but also wanted to show them how deceptive and cunning the serpent really is because the way the bowling ball was designed to be held to be held while playing is going to shock you in fact if you google how to properly hold the bowling ball it will tell you to use your middle finger and your index finger and of course your thumb as well. I want you to watch this video and we'll be right back. It's a lot of like uh, Satanism in sports. So I'm doing a documentary on sports and how there's a lot of occult things that are hidden in sports. So if you look here, right, you see the ball? Uh, what size are you? Is that large right there? XL, grab that. I'm going to show you something on camera. When they teach you how to hold it, how do they teach you to hold it? Uh, look, at your, look at your fingers, though. What, what does it form? Triangle. No, 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 no. What's the devil horns? You ever heard of the devil horns? Oh, yeah, yeah. You see how crazy oh, yeah. that? Ain't that crazy? Yeah. So when, when they design the ball, they if you Google, if you ask Google, how do you put your fingers in the bowling ball? It'll tell you your ring finger and your index finger. Uh -huh. But when you do it, it forms the devil horns. Yeah. That's crazy, right? Yeah. So we got to find a better way to hold the bowling ball, man. Yeah. Because the, the devil is the loser. Christ is the winner. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, did you see it? Could you imagine? Every time people go bowling, they're unknowingly making the sign of the Baphomet. Now, for y'all that enjoy bowling, it doesn't mean you can't have a good time. You're just gonna have to learn how to bowl in a different way. And on top of that, you need to make sure that you're not going to certain bowling alleys 
that have a very worldly environment on top of that. So with that being said, just another way the occult roots of Mystery Babylon is intertwined in so many different ways in the sport and entertainment industry. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Now, before you and I begin to scratch the surface and expose this demonic empire by microscopically examining the many inroads and ways the power of witchcraft is used by the children of the dragon in the midst of the sports and entertainment industry. You must first understand what it is that empowers witchcraft to have an effect. Remember earlier I told you that in the days of Egypt, Greece and Rome, the demonic entities, fallen angels in the dragon were feeding off of the praise, worship, and devotion as the blinded masses paid homage to false gods. But you need to understand this mystery that Satan does not want you to know. That when it comes to the occult, whether it's sorcery, magic, witchcraft, and the list goes on, it only can have power if it is fed faith, fear, dedication, devotion, and belief by those in the midst of it. Whether it's the one using it for power or those being victimized by it. If you are walking in the light, darkness has no power over you. So when it comes to the powers of Mystery Babylon and the occult, if you are truly walking with the Son of God, then you will know that according to the word of the Lord, no weapons formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment will be condemned. But remember, part of the scripture says that the Lord is our righteousness. You understand? So as a servant of the Most High God, it is my duty to make sure that you are educated with this knowledge so you will be protected against the powers of darkness. Number one, make sure you're not living a life of sin because God forbid if you have opened doors of sin in your life, this will allow the enemy to enter in and have a more effective way to attack. So you have to make sure that you are striving to obey the Most High God, denying yourself and picking up your cross, following after Him, pleasing Him, abstaining from sin and evil, and dedicating yourself to living a life of holiness unto the Lord, knowing that by the sprinkling of the blood of the Lamb, you will be protected and the Holy Ghost is given to those who obey the Most High God. 
You will be endowed with power if you do these things. And witchcraft will be like dry grass before a mighty blaze of fire. But this is why one of the biggest goals of the dragon is to cause people to fall into sin and idolatry. So the hand of God will lift off of those that are being protected and he will be able to strike at them more effectively. And do not fear witchcraft because if you are truly walking with the Son of God and serving him, you should not be afraid of witchcraft. Do not fear curses and spells because if you fear it, you feed it. You know what? I'll save that for a future documentary. I just needed you to have the understanding so you know how to fight against these evils. Because the following compilation that I have put together for you through various sources and searching diligently online is going to show you how not only in life in general, but in the sports and entertainment industry, there are more people than you think operating in the occult. And this is why you must live a life of prayer. And don't think everything is just a game. Be prayered up and have the whole armor of God on. Because you never know who could be praying against you. Or cursing the very ground you're playing a sport on. Remember that we are the manifested sons of God. And we already have the victory. But nevertheless, I want you to watch this video. And you tell me what is more important to these billionaire owners of these teams and companies and the athletes on the ground. Is sports the most important thing to them? Or is it the power of the occult? Because this is who they give the glory to. Not even realizing they're only steps away from the judgment of the Most High God and the Lake of Fire. Kyrie oh, is going to have his own all-star theme. These and are this one, killer. I love these. It's inspired by Venice. Um, so it has like the tie-dye print, the blue for the ocean. Um, there's a pseudo like Illuminati symbol on the back, which of course <laughs> is, of is course. classic Wait a minute. Kyrie. There's of course, not a pseudo Illuminati symbol. It's a distinctly. That's it's actually a, what is here on the tongue of It's called the third. It's the third eye. That uh, is amazing. Amazing. Amazing.
superstitions going into the game? Any special thing you carried into the game on Sunday that you had tucked away somewhere? Uh, uh, I did. <laughs> I always, um, you know, I've learned a lot from my wife over the years. She's so about the power of intention, you know, and believing things that are really going to happen. And she always makes a little altar for me at the game. And she always makes a little altar for me at the game. Because she, she just wills it so much. And uh, so she put together a little altar for me that I could bring with pictures of my kids. And I have these little special stones and healing stones and protection stones. And she has me wear a necklace. And I have these little special stones and healing stones and protection stones. And she has me wear a necklace. And take these drops she makes. And I say all these mantras. And I stopped it, questioning her a long works. time ago. I did. I just shut up and listened. And at first I was like, this is kind of crazy. And then about four years ago, we were playing the Seahawks. And she said, you better listen to me. This is your year. But this is all the things you're going to have to do to win. And I did all those things. And by God, you don't work. It was pretty good. <laughs> all the things you're going to have to do to win. And I did all those things. And by God, you don't work. It was pretty good. <laughs> all the things you're going to have to do to win. And I did all those things. And by God, you don't work. It was pretty good. <laughs> And right after the game, she said, see, I did a lot of work. You do your work, I do mine. She said, you're lucky you married a witch. I'm just a good witch. She said, you're lucky you married a witch. I'm just a good witch. She said, you're lucky you married a witch. I'm just a good witch. Hey, good morning. I'm doing great. Uh, we heard your sound. I ha I ha we had to talk to you for a few minutes. So you believe in witches. You believe there are witches in our presence, both good and bad, uh, in, that are living with us right now. Is that fair to say? Yes, there are witches, but they're all bad. There's no such thing as a good witch. Uh, what, so what, 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 what leads you to think, Rick, that Giselle, Brady's wife, is a witch? Well, she, well Tom Brady said she's a witch. When did you did you did you did you when did you watch when did he say that did you watch the video or just hear the sound or read a quote no, Rick watched, help me out I watched it I watched okay it. so you saw the 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 setting it was in it was in a a Gillette charitable yeah. setting where he was uh, you could see the smile on his face talking about his relationship yeah. with his wife and the impact you took that yeah. to mean that she is somehow uh, talking to demonic figures and is a witch Every, everything that Mr Brady described his wife doing is paganism it is witchcraft i did not hear once him mention uh any sort of and again i don't know what i've never met a witch so i'm i'm I, maybe someday i will but i didn't hear anything about uh the devil or worshiping anything i heard a husband explaining to people around him how his wife wants to be involved in his football life and how he yes, thinks it yes. is cute that's well, what i heard well, you heard that he's he described, he's being followed around by a he witch was, what he described was witchcraft and he said my wife is a witch. Right. He said, his wife said, you you married a witch. You married a good witch. Yeah. Right? So you, you, she, you think it's she witchcraft. meant that, you think she meant that seriously? Like she, had, so she actually has power over his football career. He's winning Super Bowls because of his wife. But he, he himself is attributing his success to witchcraft. He's practiced, she's practicing witchcraft and Tom Brady is allowing it to happen in his home. Sir, I, has anybody ever uh, <laughs> asked whether you're absolutely insane? Oh, sir, I, has anybody ever <laughs> uh, asked whether you're absolutely insane? Oh, sir, I, has anybody ever <laughs> uh, asked whether you're absolutely insane? Oh, he can he he knows what you don't know. He knows the secret. I'm just asking. You, you mentioned directly that there are deep spiritual ramifications. Oh, I want an answer Brady. to that question. Okay, go ahead. Mike. I want this man to defend his name. Do you understand that you sound like an absolute crazy person right now, Mr. Wilde? No, I, I sound like a born-again Christian who loves Jesus Christ with all my heart. You have to understand the seriousness of witchcraft. The witches will be assigned to the lake of fire. When they die, they're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire with murderers, adulterers, liars. Witches are mentioned right there with with murderers and adulterers and liars. Right. Okay? It is a eternal damnation in the lake of fire. You don't play games with witchcraft. 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 
You don't play games with witchcraft. You don't play games with witchcraft. You don't play games with witchcraft. The video that you're watching on the screen is one of many that I hope will open up your eyes even wider for you to see that this is not a game. As you could clearly see, this soccer player is rubbing some kind of witchcraft potion, some kind of liquid witchcraft potion onto the poles of this soccer goal. So whether it's somebody burning sage at a basketball court, rubbing oils on a soccer goal, sprinkling powder in a field, or water, these things are charged up by witchcraft occult powers. Brothers and sisters, this is why you have to stay prayed up and have the whole armor of God on. Because the occult is not just being performed by celebrities and professional athletes. But what about the millions who look up to these people and want to do everything that they do? So when you want to go to the park and play basketball or to a soccer field or whatever the case be, and you start feeling and discerning the presence of wickedness or what some would call bad vibes or energy, understand what that is. Make no mistake about it, more than likely, somebody did some form of an occult ritual. And this is why for you that follow Christ, when you enter into these places, you have to have the spirit of discernment and take authority over that place. Because never forget it, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And you have the power as manifested sons of God to come against all witchcraft and everything of the occult that is being performed. Whether it's a basketball court or a soccer field or any place for that matter. Take authority and break it in the almighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua, the almighty. So as you're seeing on the screen and we continue in this documentary over and over again, the occult has soldiers in many places. And these people ain't playing fair. And not only do they get these things charged up by occult powers, whether it's burning sage, water, oils, powders, dead animals, and the list goes on. This is not even, we haven't even got into when they go to witch doctors with the pictures of people they hate to try to curse them. But you see, like I told you, you have to be following the Son of God and obeying Him, trusting in Him that His blood will cover you and protect you as you live a holy life. Because God forbid if you open up doors of sin and idolatry, it can give the enemy an opportunity to strike with these powers. A perfect serve. Wicked Witchcraft down along the rail. Parisian Dust now puts her head in front. Wicked Witchcraft. And on the outside, here's Country Miss, followed by Miss Creeker. Uh, the charge into the club turn. Country Miss takes it now a length. 
Then along the rail, Parisian does second, a length, Miss Creek, your third, Reedley Valley in fourth. Wicked Witchcraft tucked in along the rail, fifth, Honey McGann, race scene six, Pecatonica last seventh, then a gap of two, Jula B. May turns out, is ninth and kin dance, tenth and last. Country Miss settles up the back stretch with a three length lead. Parisian does second by three. There goes Wicked Witchcraft. The outside, Attack. then a late charge by Pecatonica last. But it's Wicked Witchcraft today, a length and a half. Miss Creeker. Wicked Witchcraft, a length and a half. Carlos Silver aboard. Miss Creeker up for second and. relationship between the Masons of California and the Junior Giants. Well, Amy, it's now been eight years since we started this, and we began looking for a partner that had similar values to the values we had. We began looking for a partner that had similar values to the values we had. These organizations both care about kids, we both care about families, and the Junior Giants program is a perfect way for us to start. We really enjoy working with them. Over those past years, this is so impressive. More than $500,000 has been donated to Junior Giants and Gloves, which we have here tonight. But prior to the game this evening, you guys were able to give a very large donation and had a pretty famous giant on the field with you. How was that? We did. We had a chance to make a presentation for um, $82,500, which is going to give a baseball glove to 4,000 Junior Giants players who otherwise couldn't afford their own glove. So to that, that's what's really important. It's a meaningful gift to a kid who otherwise wouldn't be able to play golf and um, we had Dave Trevecki out on the field with us and what a wonderful guy just a warm good person and what an honor it was to have him share this with us. Dave's the best this is an awesome program here are the gloves you guys can take a look and if you'd like more information you can visit freemason.org. Man it seems like yesterday as a child growing up in poverty-stricken neighborhoods. We had to improvise. And we would literally take a plastic bat, cut a hole in the top and fill it with wet newspaper, and then duct tape it back together. And we would literally play home run derby in the street. And like so many other sports that I love to play, whether it was basketball, football, or soccer. But it was quite disappointing while doing this documentary to find the information that I did. Because what you're about to find out is that baseball is not only the oldest of the main sports within the United States of America. But it appears that baseball is the one sport that seems to have its very creation rooted in the occult ground of Freemasonry. And I know that would be hard to believe 
And at first, I was really hesitant. But when I started to look at the field and how it is designed, it is quite shocking how much it resembles the Masonic square and compass. And one thing you have to understand is those in the occult, especially Freemasonry, they're very particular about numbers and degrees and so on and so forth. And you start to see the connection even with the numbers used in baseball. Three strikes and three outs. You have the number 33. You have the nine innings. You have all of these things. But even the way the field is designed and the degrees and the shape, I'm starting to truly believe that baseball was birthed out of the womb of Freemasonry. And of course, you have those who will deny because there's two main strategies to the powers of darkness, the white and the black on the checkered floor. It represents two opposites that are really working together, you understand? That's why when you see those in, in high places in the occult look like nice people, they donate, they help people. But behind the scenes, they're demonic to the core. So you'll have those that will deny this and to cause confusion, bring up multiple founders of baseball and which one is really the one. But the more you connect the dots, the more convincing it becomes. But look, I'm not a Mr. Know-it-all. I'm not going to sit here and try to act like, not, like I know everything about Major League Baseball. What I would rather do is play a video and let you hear it from the very mouth of a Mason. Now, this video is well over an hour long. So to save time, I simply edited out the points of him talking about baseball and Freemasonry. He goes on to say there's over 60 baseball players in the Hall of Fame that are Freemasons. That's just in the Hall of Fame, brothers and sisters. He starts talking about how the fathers of children that go into little leagues and he brags about how so many of them are Masons and all that they do within baseball, donations and this and that. He starts talking about Spalding. This is the creator of Spalding, the sports company, how he was a very prominent Freemason. And the list goes on, brothers and sisters. I'm letting you know that all the dots are connecting and it really does appear that baseball originated on the foundation of Freemasonry. But the question is, if this is true, if one participates in the actual sport, I'm not talking about at the park, playing home run derby, something more simplified, but the literal game, could they be actually participating in an occult Freemasonic ritual. This is what you have to ask yourself. And I know for some of you, you love the sport of baseball and this is very troubling to you because now you may have to make a decision. So I want you to watch this edited video where I'm simply putting all the video clips together from this long drawn out speech that he gives to save time. And whenever you hear him say the word brother, He's referring to one of their own. So I want you to watch this video and we'll be right back. On with stuff. At that break, there's three handouts that you should all get. Uh, one is a handout that has to do with the vintage baseball stuff that we're gonna explain a little bit about. So it's got a little bit of the rules in it and some interesting stuff just about vintage ball. Then, uh, 
this lecture is happening sort of because of an article that I put together for the Empire State Mason magazine that's going to come out fall issue. Uh, originally, the idea of that magazine, of the article in the magazine, was uh, it had occurred to me that there were many men in the Baseball Hall of Fame who happened to be Masons. So what I tried to do was to put together two so-called fantasy teams and have Masons playing Masons, irregardless of when they got into the Hall of Fame, just to have Masons versus Masons. I had uh, men in the same position in each case. So the first baseman from one team is just as good as the first baseman from another team, and they're both Hall of Famers. So I've got a copy of the article that's going to come out in which I've mentioned 22 different Masons, and there's a graphic of what the two different fields might look like. So pick up the article, although it'll be in the next magazine. And then through my research, when I first started, I found out that there were like 26 or 28 men who were Masons in the Hall of Fame. Well, after I finished doing research that I started, I came out with a list of around 43 men. So the third list is a list of 43 men, uh, the years that they played, the lodge that they hailed from, and the year that they were inducted into the Hall of Fame. I can tell you that since I printed this up last week, information has come to me about another 16 players. So that would dare say bring the amount of men who are Masons, who happen to be in the, balls, in the Baseball Hall of Fame, that puts us up to 60. I'll start with just one question before I get into what I'm going to talk about. And it sort of has to do with, uh, well, baseball. So I'm going to ask a question. Let's see if I can get an answer. When somebody is running the square of a baseball field, who can tell me how far they're running? So I'm going to ask a question. Let's see if I can get an answer. When somebody is running the square of a baseball field, who can tell me how far they're running? 360 degrees. Feet. 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 360 feet, 90 foot from base to base. Okay, what does that translate to in yards? Uh, what's 360 feet in yardage? Uh, three feet to a yard. 120 yards. Okay, so when somebody is running the square of a baseball field, they're running the length of a football field plus both end zones. That's a fact. Nobody's ever really equated the square to the distance of what it really is. You understand? So that's a great feat to be able to run a whole field at one time. My lodge and my district both sponsored Little League teams because it was Little League. Uh, my lodge and my district have both sponsored Little, team, little League teams for roughly 30 years. In other words, wherever I moved, I always got that league to be sponsored by a Masonic entity. I was glad to do that. So, now I'm going to go into why we're here, talking about baseball. And then, in the second half, is where I'm going to really begin to talk about masonry and the baseball. Baseball has a ritual all of its own. Baseball has a game has a much more modest and humble apprenticeship than the complicated business that it is today. Are players standing on geometric shapes? Occult Kabbalistic rituals showing Freemasonic symbolism concerning both geometry and numerology, sacred numbers, is rampant on the internet. The game does have many inferences that can be drawn to masonry. The field, from home plate to the left and right walls, form a compass. The entire outfield wall is the semicircle which this compass draws. Upside down, overlapping the compass, the three bases form the square. Three strikes and three outs were assigned because three is a sacred number throughout history as well as in Freemasonry. Four recalls the four directions common to so many sacred traditions as the, squ as the square formed by the four bases as well as four balls for a walk. The nine is represented as the multiple of the three, represented by the nine fielding positions. The 
bases, you have a guard at every door. And the nine innings to the game, 81, the multiple of nine is half of a season. Is this all coincidence, or is it part of a master plan? <coughs> the leading proponent of the theory was a seven-season ball player, a Mason, named uh, Albert Spaulding, who also happened to have opened a sporting good company in 1876, two years before he quit baseball. The publicity was good for business. It's also interesting for me personally, as this season, with my hardball team, we are still using Spaulding balls. He is buried in Arlington Na National Cemetery under the Masonic symbol of an obelisk, however. In 1845, the Knickerbocker Baseball Club was organized in New York City by our brother Alexander J. Cartwright, who created rules to distinguish his brand of baseball from other forms throughout the country. His rules helped shape the game. By the end of the 19th century, it was a sport that provided a step up, a glamorous career opportunity for youth coming from lower socioeconomic origins. Few of the ball players ever attended college. Very often, though, they had one thing in common. Their fathers had been Masons. As an aside, our brother, Jimmy Fox, first baseman extraordinaire who was noted for his batting, particularly as a home run hitter, he hit over 500 of them. He managed the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, immortalized in the movie, A League of Their Own. He hailed from George Batron Lodge in Media, Pennsylvania, eventually becoming the full-time manager of, the speci of their specific team. Business executives, however, were the true architects of the game, were the true architects of the game, were the true architects of the game, who helped to interweave their interests and concerns into the game, <coughs> while making it a better game for all concerned. The following are some brothers in the Hall of Fame who hate, helped to shape the game to what it is today. Who hate helped to shape the game to what it is today. So whether you believe this is really what it is or not is your choice. But this is as far as I'm going to go on the topic of the Freemason baseball connection because we got way too many other things to expose and go over. And you may be disappointed, but just remember that I'm gonna tell you the truth because I love you. How you receive it doesn't change the reality. And as much as you wanna deny that Freemasonry is the father of baseball, all the evidence being brought together is proving Otherwise. Okay. All right. All right. All right. We're going to settle it right now. We're going to settle it right now. Please be nice. Please. In the case of the little one, eight month old baseball, you are the father.
This is the home of a celebrated South African Sangoma, or traditional healer, and his specialty is football. Vivian is a local coach who has come for a consultation ahead of tomorrow's game. He's come for his muti, the ingredients of Zulu medicine. Every time when I'm going to play the game, I'm come to this man to take a muti and a monkey hand, and uh, I know that I'm going to win, definitely. The dried hand of a baby monkey is the signature of this man's Zulu sorcery. This monkey hand that I got in the bush is specially for the goalkeeper because it has the power to grab and stop the ball. Other concoctions are dispensed during the consultation, like the fat from a cane rat to make the team's forwards more agile during the game. Then Vivian is reminded of the basic rules of a highly complex ceremony. They will be sprinkled with the Sangoma's magic powder after it is diluted in water. Finally, everyone is ready for the game. They are playing a league match in Josini on the Mozambican border. Even the goalkeeper says he feels stronger than ever. He has carefully hidden the baby monkey's hand under his shirt sleeve. I always keep it on my arm. It protects me and makes me feel confident. The team has won their match and Vivian is happy. Over the last two years, he has brought his men up to the third division and hopes one day to hold a national trophy. You remember earlier when I showed you the video of Neymar, one of the greatest soccer players I've ever seen. At one point in his life, he was very bold for the Son of God. But as he was in the midst of wolves, it appears that he slowly started to change. And according to the information that I found, he really did make an agreement to receive over five million to no longer be bold and speak about Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua, the Almighty. But brothers and sisters, do you think it is a coincidence that not too long after that, a video came out that showed witches, shamans, placing a curse upon him using his own picture in a voodoo doll reenacting the breaking and damaging of his legs. What would be the odds that not too long after that he was badly injured while on the field? You see, brothers and sisters, the reason why I brought this up is because you have to understand the danger of walking away from the Lord. Adonai, Yeshua the Messiah. You see, he is our protection. And when a person chooses the world, sin, fame, and money, and turns their back on the Son of God, there is a demonic door that opens. And do you think these witches don't understand these principles? And of course, I would hope that it wasn't true. And I still hope it wasn't true. But every source that I've looked at shows that he did accept that money. So brothers and sisters, this is why you need to pray for others and this is why you need to pray for yourself that you will remain faithful to the very end no matter what and all we are doing is simply scratching the surface of how deep this really goes because if you will stand for the almighty and the light of God will shine through you and the power of the Holy Spirit will be evident in your life. Think of how many that are in the occult will repent and want to know this mighty God that breaks every curse they've ever done and destroys any powers they try to conjure. Have you ever considered this? 
that we cannot be ashamed of the gospel, even if we're greatly outnumbered. Because in reality, we're not. We may be outnumbered on this earth, but when you look into the heavenly realm, our enemies are the ones that are outnumbered. Because there's far more with us in the spirit than there is with them. So as we move on to the next part of this documentary, we're going to talk about the dangers of idolatry and how many ways the sports and entertainment industry has infiltrated the minds of the masses, just as the days of Egypt and Greece and Rome and other places to lift up pagan gods and goddesses blindly worshiping demonic entities as the book of Ephesians tells us principalities and powers rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places the dragon needed this to happen again so by utilizing the sports industry he has created idols in human form that are willing to sell out and take upon themselves ancient demonic entities that as people lift them up and idolize them, the worship, praise, and adoration, dedication will go to the demons that are governing behind the scenes and ultimately to the dragon. Let us examine some of the many ways idolatry is being propagated into the minds of the masses because idolatry is one of the fastest ways to provoke the most high God to anger and the devil knows this and he knows that many of you have a wall around you you are protected but if he can cause you to sin but he wants to try to cause as many that are protected by the almighty to sin and commit idolatry so that hedge of protection will be removed do you understand and this is one of the most important reasons why i had to take the time to do this documentary and in reality, there are other documentaries that I have to get done that are far more important than this one, including The World is a Stage, Part 5. And by the grace of God, may it get released sooner than later. But I wanted to do this documentary because so many of you and others that you know have been bound through deception by way of this sports and entertainment industry, whether it's idolizing athletes or just simply idolizing sports, where it's consuming your mind, provoking God to jealousy, it's time to repent. And I'm not saying you can't get involved with sports. That has to be something between you and the most high God. You have to listen to what he tells you because it's not cookie cutter. Not everybody has the same struggles. There are many that are able to get involved with sports and they're nice and balanced. They don't let it consume them. It's not idolatry. They don't become carnal. They just have a great time, but they remain godly in the process. And their main focus is glorifying Christ while they do it. And because of that, this is a individual thing. You have to seek the face of God to guide you on what you're able to do and what you're not, what you can keep around in your life and what you just might have to lay on the altar. So with that being said, let us carry on in the next chapter of this documentary where we expose the many ways the enemy has brought in the terrible sin of idolatry. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. As you might expect, 
God has an awesome tennis game. Perfect form with unlimited power. That is why he needs only this racket. You, on the other hand, Call it. Uh, would do much better with the extended sweet spot of the Prince Extender Thunder. <laughs> Extender Thunder, the most powerful racket on Earth. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. When I come on the field, I feel like that. I feel untouchable and I will smash everyone that comes in my way. Now, before you and I walk down this road of exposing the ancient roots of idolatry within sports. We must first go over the definition of the word religion. It is the belief in and worship of a superhuman power or powers, especially as God or gods. I want you to think about that. What is the common denominator as billions of people idolize these athletes? Yes or no, do they appear to have superhuman abilities? Their height, power, speed, and accuracy almost appears to the masses as if they are superhuman and above them. You see, one doesn't have to call something a god to make it their religion and put their faith, adoration, and belief into it. It's the same principle of what the Most High God has said about love in the scriptures. He said, don't just love with your words, but love in your actions. So that same principle applies. It isn't just calling something a God, but making it a idol by their actions. But notice that it also says down below, it is a particular system of faith and worship. Notice that it says it is a pursuit or interest to do which someone ascribes supreme importance. I want you to think about how important sports, teams, and athletes are to those that are fully committed and involved in this religion. Because there's no way around it. You can say all you want. The same hypocrites that will reject the word of the Lord when somebody tries to tell them anything about the son of God The first thing they will say Is I don't want to deal with all that religion I'm not a religious person But yet going over this definition They're probably more religious Than most people Around them It's just that their religion Is called Sports and entertainment So it doesn't appear to be religion At all even though it is. But that's when it hit me. What if the ancient ways of sports in the days of Egypt and Greece and Rome were never separated from religion to begin with? What if they integrated the worship of these pagan gods and goddesses in the midst of all the sports activities they did in those ancient times. What if the very roots is all about the worshiping, sacrifice, and dedication to these false pagan gods and goddesses, which ultimately really it goes to the principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places, the kingdom of the dragon. 
And then that would explain why they're constantly integrating the names of false gods and goddesses just like Nike. So I began to go on a journey and I found out brothers and sisters that sport was a very important form of worship in ancient Greek and Roman religions. In the ancient Olympic games, they were held in honor of the head pagan deity, Zeus. You see, religion in sports were one. They were united. There wasn't any separation between the two of them. And as I started to look up other names that sound very familiar in this last hour, you know, like the World Olympics. But you see, the word Olympics is from the word Olympia, from Mount Olympus. This is actually the very home of these pagan Greek gods. So now all the pieces of the puzzle are starting to come together, aren't they? Because now you see why the NFL has to have a Super Bowl halftime with some form of lifting up. And think of all the halftime shows there has been in the many ways they've integrated the occult and pagan worship in the midst. And this is not even including all the demonic, blasphemous commercials that are presented to millions of people every single year during the Super Bowl. Because the Super Bowl halftime show is their way of paying homage to the ancient fallen angels, what people would believe to be the gods of Greece and Rome. Why do you think whenever they declare a new Super Bowl, they put the numbers in Roman numerals? You see, this is a connection that they have to let it be known where the roots come from. And whenever you hear the word bowl or cup, when winning a sport, think about the root of that because even the demonic goddess Nike is known to have a bowl or a cup in her possession as she gives victory to those who pay homage to her, to call upon her, to summon her. Are you starting to see it now? And look, there are so many different sports. I just can't cover everything. We're already around three hours into this documentary. We've already done videos on the UFC. I've already done other videos on the Super Bowl. Not to mention being fair and balanced, showing honor to some that were trying to glorify Christ in the process. And like I said, some are genuine and some are not. You need discernment to know the difference. And when you bring it all together, this is exactly why the only way you can get involved with sports is if you truly give the glory to the one and true living God. You see, when you glorify Jesus Christ, when you acknowledge God the Father, it will keep you from falling into these carnal, demonic ways. Why do you think so many people get violent and angry and carnal while doing sports? I mean, remember when the term beast mode was so popular in sports? Because it's all about summoning the power of the flesh instead of giving glory to Christ from your spirit man. So when you start to put the pieces together, think of how many ways sports has become a religion to billions of people. 
Let's just talk about a few different categories and topics that normally would be given to the Most High God as a form of religious practice or a way of worship, adoration, dedication, and praise. And before we begin, I want you to think about how crafty the enemy is that he would emphasize a lot of sports, especially the NFL, on Sunday. Because he wanted to mock the word of the Lord by saying to a whole lot of men who are not really being men at home. They're not serving the Lord. They're not dedicating their life to Christ. The devil is saying to these men, and it's not just men, but he's saying to the men because they're the head of the house. Choose you this day who you gonna serve. Jesus Christ or your favorite football team. You see how he twisted and tried to mock the word of the Lord by giving people an ultimatum. It's Sunday. Now, we know the Sabbath day is not Sunday, but this is when most people open up the doors to the church buildings, to the ministry buildings to have a church service. Do not miss my point. So now they have a decision to make and the power of the occult causes them to never really want to be a part of some Sunday gathering because they're too dedicated to their favorite sports team. That is their real religion even though they don't admit it. Think of how dedicated they are. They can memorize all the names of every player on the team, the head coach. They can remember the things that happened in the past 20 Super Bowls, but can't remember and quote three scriptures from the word of the Lord. It is a religion. Think of how they're dedicated. They will shed tears. They will scream and shout when their team does well. But the word of God says to shout unto the Lord. Think of how they will gather together and spend thousands of dollars to see a football game. And the same hypocrites that mock people that want to sow into the kingdom of God will spend thousands of dollars to go to the Super Bowl. Spend on your Super Bowl tickets. 13 grand. 10,000 bucks. 10,000 tickets. 8,500 apiece. 8,000. You see, that's their tithes and offerings. And it's all about bringing the people together. And let me make this clear. I'm not talking about people that serve Christ and are not bound to idolatry that want to enjoy a sport. I am talking about those that are blinded that will gather together by the thousands. And you know, as I was meditating on that, in the word of the Lord, it says that all of the people before the most high God is like a sea of glass. And remember how the beast will rise out of the sea. We know this is not a literal ocean. It is talking about a sea of people once again, you see this religious mockery because the dragon knows when these, when all these people gather together, committing idolatry, lifting up their idols and giving their passion, devotion, sacrifice and time to the true religion of their life, which is sports, they become the sea of people. Why do you think they created the wave? During games, you will see the crowd form a wave that will literally encircle the entire Colosseum because the dragon is mocking that he has people that are supposed to be gathering together in his last hour for the Most High God to proclaim Jesus Christ. But instead, they become, they have become the sea of idolatry making waves as they're bound by idolatry.
Do we have anyone in the building today willing to testify? Talk to me now. He's done so much already. We've witnessed him do so much already. We've heard about the things this man can do already. Cleveland is a city of champions once again. And we just can't help but celebrate him. Haters, go ahead and recognize that when you speak on his name, you're going to go higher, higher, higher. Shame! So excuse me while I cut a step, because I can't help but to honor him, and I can't help but to lift him up, and I've got one last question for you. Faith is fundamental. Religion has been the bedrock of every culture in history. Today, religion is retreating. And yet, still faith remains. If I were to be a religious person, this would be like going to the cathedral. The more I look at sports, myths and legends, true believers in holy wars, the more I believe that sports is where we humans place our faith. Each time you fight, it's kind of like a baptism. For a moment, you're being dumped underwater. When you come up, and you've been cleansed, and, and now you're this new you, it's like we're every fight. Free diving is an intensely spiritual experience. It's always been about exploration of my own kind of potential and human boundaries. Religion of sports was a journey to prove that sports aren't like religion, they are religion. You need something that brings your community together. And there are a lot of places that that's church. But for where I grew up at, your church is on Saturday night. To help advise us on our journey, we sought the wisdom of two scions of sport, Tom Brady and Michael Strahan. I understood it immediately, the fandom and the passion that they have. When I'm out in the field in front of 70,000 people, I can kind of do what I want. I can really be who I am. Our premise was based on the belief in the power of real-time stories, dynamic human dramas happening right now. King in Texas. I mean, football legitimizes a community. Our quest to find these stories took us literally around the world. From the most storied rivalries to the most obscure arenas, we learned there's no place on earth untouched by the power of sports. We have to do it all together. We have to believe. Could you get any bigger than this? Our young religion has amassed a flock of young evangelists. Passionate creatives who share our vision for a religion of sports that is a dynamic avenue for mythic storytelling. I'd like to measure myself against the best. And you guys worked your butt off. Football on three. One, two, three. Football!
going up. All right, ladies, there's only one spot left in my fantasy football league and two of you. Why don't we flip a coin? I prefer a more old-fashioned approach. Two of you walked into this room, but only one's walking out. No, 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 I was kidding. No, I was kidding. Tom, you're in the league. Bill, you're insane. Start your league at ESPN.com slash fantasy football. And the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. 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 Cutting out my baseball trading cards. What trading cards? The ones you get free on all post cereal packages. Pictures of the top major leaguers with rundowns on all of them. Wow. And you get as many as seven on every post cereal package. 200 and all. Three. Wow. And all you have to do is buy post cereals. That's Cena. Gee, there's Roger Maris and Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle. He looks so real. Well, kids, baseball season's here again. And with Post Serial's baseball trading cards, you can get a rundown on all your favorite players. Hey, he talked to me. Mickey Mantle talked to me. Hey, he talked to me. Mickey Mantle talked to me. Hey, he talked to me. Mickey Mantle talked to me. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. 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 
Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Little children, keep yourselves from idols.